Sandy, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm horticulture educator for Champaign, Ford, Iroquois, and Vermilion counties uh, right here in East Central Illinois. And I want to thank you all for joining us today on this program about small shrubs. So one of the things that we talk we talk about these, and here's my you should be looking at my the overall uh, intro slide. So it should say small shrubs, big impact, short work. Hopefully that says. So if we think about you know think about small shrubs, I, I think one of the things to think about is you know what what is our definition of the qu sort of quality time in the garden? What's your definition of quality time in the garden? Are you that uh, that that gaggle of people there on the left, or are you the person on the right just sharing time, hanging out with your dog, and enjoying your beautiful garden? Uh, so what is your definition of what that is? Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't I can't think of one person that I've ever heard say, gee, I wish my garden was more maintenance. So I think one of the things that we all look for, I'm, I'm assuming, is less maintenance or lesser maintenance. You know, it's fun to hang out with uh, people in the garden, but sure, sure would be nice if we could actually really sit back and enjoy our garden. Um, and, and so that's one of the options. Uh, have, have you ever heard that perennial flowers sort of listed as these these low maintenance plants? You know, if you want a low maintenance garden, you plant perennials, right? How many times have you heard that? Uh, and it, it certainly is one of those things that we in, we enjoy perennials. Perennial perennial flowers give us so much when it comes to flowering and different flowering times. And I love my perennials. But if you really sort of sit back and think about perennial flowers, are they truly low maintenance? Uh, some of them are certainly more uh, low maintenance than others, but if you think about it, if you have some that maybe, you know, I love bee balm, it happens to be one of those plants that is a great plant, I love it for the butterflies and the bees, but, you know, you have to divide it periodically or it kind of gets a little bit out of bounds, uh, might want to deadhead it. So perennial flowers are great and then we don't have to replant them, but when we really think about maintenance stuff, if we were to think about that, you know, maybe perennial flowers aren't necessarily the, our only option, and that's really what what today's program is all about because if we think about it really shrubs are perennials right when we think of, when we say perennials it always seems like we think immediately think of perennial flowers the herbaceous kind that don't form woody stems and it, but I'm asking today is for everyone to sort of really sort of expand your definition of what perennial is and really consider some of the shrubs that are out there and add them not necessarily along the foundation as we often do around our homes but really think about them more as a plant that you'd actually put in to your flower garden. This happens to be a picture of the Champaign County Master Gardener's Idea Garden in Urbana. If you ever get a chance to come out, it's just a great opportunity, just one of those many opportunities to sort of see how they've used actually shrubs within their flower borders. So it is one of those things. So this is the Idea Garden in Urbana, Illinois. If you think about, again, sort of flowering shrubs, what do they offer us? Flowering shrubs certainly uh, can offer a very long bloom period, sometimes longer than what we might think of with our perennial flowers. Uh, ornamental fruits, we don't necessarily always get those with perennial flowers. Some of them actually have very nice seed heads, and we enjoy those. Uh, ornamental leaves, lots of our perennial flowers certainly give us that with different colors. But I would also say that flowering shrubs can often give us that when it comes to different colors, variegation, burgundy, chardonnay truth and even evergreen we have we have some evergreen or semi evergreen perennial flowers but we don't necessarily have a lot of them if you're looking for evergreen plants really shrubs are one of those that really can fill that bill uh, also fall color we certainly have some perennial flowers that offer fall color the amsonia the blue star is just a beautiful yellow fall color but that's one of the few, I think, that really gives us really great fall color when it comes to perennial herbaceous flowers. Whereas with shrubs, there's lots of them that will give us that fall color. When we think about winter interest, perennial flowers certainly have some great seed heads, as I mentioned, uh, maybe some nice stems, things we like to look at. But for a lot of times, there isn't a whole lot to look at in the wintertime when it comes to just a perennial flower border. So how about have some shrubs in there so you can really add some winter interest? 
And so also when it comes to just maintenance kinds of things, and we think about flowering shrubs, that generally there's not a whole lot of spring cleanup. Uh, the stems often, you know, obviously they're going to be woody stems, so usually we don't have to do much with that. Sometimes we get a little winter kill, so you might have to do a little bit of spring cleanup, uh, maybe just a little bit of pruning periodically, and I'll talk about that with some of the shrubs that, that I've selected. Generally we're not going to have to divide them or thin them. So we're talking about pruning, maybe a little bit, of deadheading, those kind of things, but not really thinning and dividing. Most of them don't spread, but I will say some of the shrubs do spread. And I'll talk about these. Uh, chokeberry and summer sweet are certainly ones we'll talk about, which are great shrubs. But when they're happy plants, and sumac's another one of those, when they're happy plants, they actually can send out some suckers. So you just have to keep that in mind and just make sure that you have them in a spot where you don't really care about that. Uh, this happens to be a picture of tiger eye sumac. I'm not going to talk about that specifically, but it is a great shrub and actually almost a small tree, and it, and it will sucker, but I just love the foliage on it. And this time of year, it actually has a very nice reddish kind of fall color as well. And I think one of the reasons why we don't think about shrubs, I don't know why we've sort of dis decided we think about them around the foundation and we don't think about them any other time, is this what I call foes. Um, the, this affliction that I think a lot of us have when it comes to design. And we've totally bypassed shrubs. And uh, foes is actually this fear of house-eating shrubs. Uh, I think all of us, maybe at one time or another, you came across, uh, maybe you, you moved into our house, or as a kid you have uh, this kind of a situation where you had these huge shrubs, they were eating the house, um, you had to either try and prune them back or get rid of them or whatever. So I think this is this whole idea is that many of the shrubs in the past uh, were planted up right next to the foundation, and with a lot of the new cultivars now, we don't have this sort of house-eating shrub kind of effect. Uh, certainly many of the ones that we had in the past were absolutely like this, but I think hopefully people kind of open their eyes to some of the newer cultivars, and that's what I'm going to try to do today, is sort of get you familiar with some of the newer cultivars that you don't have to worry about this affliction of uh, fear of house-eating shrubs. So this is our, our first one that I'm going to talk about, and this is actually, if you have your plant list in front of you, uh, this is actually slide nine, and this is a red chokeberry. The fun thing about this one is it actually is a native plant. Now, I, what I tried to do is I tried to select some small-ish plants. Not all of them are small. This happens to be one that's a little bit taller, so red cho chokeberry, it certainly can get six to ten feet. But what I like about red chokeberry is just the fact that because it's very upright, that it's easily, you can easily put it within a border and actually plant things close to it. So it's not this big mound of things. It's actually very upright so that you can easily put things close to it or plant things around it. So it makes a pretty nice companion uh, because of its kind of long legs. Uh, probably the other thing to keep in mind is there's one of those that will sucker to form a colony. So it's kind of nice to sort of keep that in mind or just realize it may do that, um, especially if it's in an area where there's uh, quite a bit of moisture. This is an amazingly adaptable plant, which is the good thing about it, that even though it does very well in wet areas, it can take dry areas. Probably the other great thing about this particular plant is just the fact that it has this beautiful fall color. As you can see, it's really a great alternative to burning bush because not only does it have a great fall color, it also has a nice fruit set. So it has this wonderful sort of reddish fruit that, that does a pretty good job of hanging on into the winter time. So not only do you get nice spring flowers, you'll also get fruit set, and you'll also get a nice fall color. So this is really one of those kind of multi-season plants I would consider. Uh, Brillantissima happens to be one of them that I think is a good cultivar. It tends to have more flowers and uh, more fruit, so, and it's a really common one. So the Brillantissima red chokeberry I think is, an, is a really nice one to sort of start out with. There's only a number of black chokeberries out there. If you're familiar with uh, the, just a straight species of black chokeberry, it tends to be a little taller. It's five to seven feet tall, those kind of things. So it, it is another one that would be good, but it's a little bit bigger plant. This happens to be one of the newer cultivars of black chokeberry. So this is one called a low scape chokeberry. And you can see how tiny this thing is. And I thought this is really a good one to show just how small these plants are. These are true dwarfs. So this would be one about one to two feet tall, two feet wide. It's a little mound. This is not one that you're necessarily going to have to worry about too much sort of eating your house because it just is a very slow grower. 
makes a really nice ground cover for one thing, and also even maybe an edging plant. It's very adaptable. They have this wonderful sort of glossy leaves on them. It does have sort of a purple-black fruit as opposed to the red that we saw before, and it does have a nice uh, red fall color. So it has a number of things going for it. So I think that's another one that to really sort of think about, and it's so completely different than what you would think of as the straight species of black chokeberry. I think it's worth looking at. Now, when it comes to shrubs, barberry, I think, are one of those. Is, is con They're just about on every single street corner. They're just everywhere. It was one of the first plants, I think, that we really got into because it was often grown for this kind of maroonish, fall, uh, this maroonish leaf color through the season. And crimson pygmy was this common one, and you can pretty much find it everywhere these days, and it was probably horribly overplanted. But it was one. We liked it because it had this kind of crimson foliage to it. So, so barberries are one of those that's an option um, and I will we're back to that whole idea is that there's so many newer cultivars of barberry that make it a much better plant again this is another picture that was out at the Champaign County Master Gardeners Idea Garden this happens to be golden ring barberry I don't have a close-up of the leaf but it actually is a maroon leaf with kind of a yellow ring around it and it happens to be the rubidor wigella which is there to the top right and then gold flame spirea so here we see lots and lots of color uh, really early in the season when there's not a whole lot of other things going on so that's really kind of a fun fun grouping of plants so so barberries are one of those that certainly the prickles can be annoying so they have these little prickles on them um, they do bloom on old wood and the reason I say that is that generally we're always growing these really for the leaf color and so we really don't want these to set fruit uh, because in some areas uh, barberry has gotten to be an invasive weed and I will tell you crimson pigment Crimson pygmy seems to be the one that's most invasive. So unfortunately, that old cultivar, crimson pygmy, seems to have really taken off. It'll form these little red fruits on them that birds like to eat them, and the next thing you know, they're all over the place into woodland areas. So I'd stay away from crimson pygmy. Um, but these newer ones are much better. They're not nearly as invasive, and, I, and if you have concerns about that, or even if you have the old version of Crimson Pygmy, but you're not really ready to get rid of it, then just cut it down to the ground every spring. And because it blooms on old wood, it won't bloom, and then you won't get fruit, and then it won't be invasive. So that's kind of a way to sort of deal with a plant that, that has, is showing some invasive qualities, and we really don't want that to happen. So I don't think we're ready to totally throw out barberries. They, they still have some really good options. So and then in that same respect, here's one called Gold Pillar, which I, and it is truly a pillar, this very, very upright look to it. This is one that's about three or four feet tall and about two feet wide, so half that in, in width. It has a really kind of a nice reddish new growth, certainly it's this orangey red fall color that it can get, but it really has this chartreuse leaf, and especially early in the season when they're first coming out. So that yellow, I mean, what a knockout color when it comes to that plant around other maybe darker plants. This is one I've kind of noticed, and you'll notice with a lot of the chartreuse plants, is that as the season progresses, they kind of lose that really vivid yellow. They stay yellow, but they can, they can get a little, almost a little more washed out yellow, so it's not always quite as vivid as it shows here. This is a really a nice one in containers. I, I've had one of these in containers that I do go ahead and uh, you know, grow, put a whole bunch of petunias and stuff around it, and it's just beautiful. It does very well in containers. And then through the winter time, I go ahead and plant it out into the garden, and then I dig it up in the spring and put it back in a container because you really wouldn't want to leave these in containers over the winter. So gold pill pillar barberry might be a nice one to sort of think about. Uh, this now on the other end of the spectrum, I guess, is this tiny little guy called Gold Beret. It's 6 to 12 inches tall, if you can believe that. So these are true dwarfs. Uh, I know a lot of us don't necessarily uh, believe the plant labels because we've always been, we're all, I think, have had those situations where, you know, you believe a plant label and next thing you know it's like eight feet tall and it was supposed to be three feet tall. Well, this one I have seen, it just stays this little compact dwarf. So this is gold beret, little bitty thing. This mound of gold, it has kind of a, this reddish new growth that you're seeing here as well as a red fall color. So we're back to the whole thing of this. This is really for leaf color. We're not, we're not concerned about the flowers and actually we really don't care about flowers at all, which is also kind of a nice thing. And then also mini salsa. 
This is, in a lot of respects, this is a much improved version of that earlier crimson pygmy. So this is a two feet tall, two feet wide, so it's a nice size that you could put into a flower border area, or even if you wanted to use it as a landscape planting. Uh, it had this dark red foliage. Uh, it is a nice one. I think it looks great from spring to fall. It certainly still has little prickles on it, but because you really don't have to prune it, to speak of, I don't really even notice the little prickles because I just generally don't have to worry about that too much. It, very low maintenance. These are very drought tolerant plants, full sun, uh, and also reported to be deer, deer resistant. So if you're one of those folks that's really looking for a plant that, uh, you know, you have a lot of problems with deer, this might be a good good selection for you. And actually, even if they trim it down, I've had rabbits trim my barberry down sometimes in the springtime, and, and that's great. That's one less work one less job for me the the rabbits have helped me out because it'll go ahead and, and sucker up from the base and here's that mini salsa again what a cutie huh it's a little nice for a little containers i just love the little reddish new growth and these are again so these true dwarfs where they just are very slow growing and it just really nice in containers as well as a flower bed area so that's kind of the, you can see the fall color here. Isn't that great? And it's truly that color. I'm not just making these up through the, through the, through the magic of photography. It really is that vivid color. And so what a great combo. Now, when we also think about uh, flowering shrubs, I guess butterfly bush would certainly be one of those. And, and I think it was that, one of those first ones where I really started thinking about was butterfly bushes. Realize that there's probably there's over 150 different cultivars of butterfly bush, so there's a ton of them out there. So you really have to do your homework, uh, find out which ones you like, because they vary immensely when it comes to the the uh, size of the flowers, the size of the plant itself, even the habit of the plant is very, very different. So do a little homework before you start uh, heading to the garden center and really figure out which, which one you think you'd like or like to have. Uh, the leaves themselves actually can go anywhere from a very silvery gray to just a very dark green. So you will have some that actually have more of a dark green color. They don't have much in the way of fall color. I haven't seen a lot of that. Sometimes you get a little bit of yellow, but that's probably not their big thing. Certainly the flowers are their big thing. Uh, they attract butterflies and the hummingbirds and certainly even uh, like this hummingbird moth here uh, it really enjoys it they have nice long flower periods so we like that uh, this is one of those that will will benefit if you can go ahead and deadhead it uh, it will tend to flower longer and then you'll also not have to worry about any kind of reseeding because in some areas especially in the northwest u.s they have had problems with butterfly bush actually uh, reseeding itself so that's not a good thing so this is one of those things that if you can spend a little time deadheading you'll, you'll you will be rewarded it's not like something you have to have to do but I will tell you it is one of those that you might keep that in mind to go ahead and dead that deadhead those uh, sometimes in cold wet winters we can't have some stem die back and, and a little winter kale but that's fine they'll usually go ahead and come up from the base anyway and then you'll just be fine and actually I think they're ones that do better if you can prune them back in the springtime even if they don't die back even to go ahead and, and prune them back they actually look a lot better um, and it, probably at least six hours of sun. This is one of those that probably would really do better in, in some sun. And certainly this is one of those that we really don't recommend planting it in the fall. You know, a lot of shrubs we say spring or fall, plant it, no problem. I would really encourage you to plant butterfly bush in the springtime and not in the fall. That way it gets well established before we get into the cold season. So uh, it's just kind of some basics when it comes to butterfly bush. Uh, this was one that came, came out a few years ago called Blue Chip. Uh, which I particularly like simply because it is a nice size. It's back to that kind of two feet tall, three feet wide, so it's an easy one to use. But because it's a true dwarf, I will also say it tends to have smaller flowers, uh, overall just overall a smaller plant, so smaller flowers and those kind of things. So it, I think it's a great plant, but it doesn't have those huge racemes of flowers that we might think of as some of the bigger butterfly bushes. But I think it's just a much easier plant to use in a in a in a situation like a flower border because it's not as big as many of those you know earlier cultivars that we had so this blue chip i think is really really a nice one and certainly attracts the butterflies as you can see here uh, nice in containers i i just like something very simple like this i know a lot of us usually think about putting four or five or 
six different plants in a container, but just have some of these shrubs in the containers are great to have these over the summertime. And then the nice thing is, you know, come fall, again, I already said you probably shouldn't plant it in the fall, but uh, I have done this and been okay, uh, is to go ahead and then plant it into a garden situation in the fall. It's probably not ideal, and I usually try to mulch it. Um, but then I would not leave it in containers like this over the winter time. That's probably the big thing. So you take a little bit of a risk, but the nice thing is this is a plant that you could you could easily put in containers and then maybe even plant it out in your landscape later on and, and uh, add more plants to your landscape. So blue chip butterfly bush. Now we get into some of the bigger ones, and these are actually ones that I think are nice in that they have such a presence when it comes to the flowers themselves. So this is purple emperor. And the, this is a little bit bigger. We're back to that kind of four to five foot feet tall. It tends to be much bushier. I think the one thing I don't like about some of the older cultivars of butterfly bush is that they tend to be kind of these gangly kind of, you know, I don't know how to describe it, just gangly. Uh, and they kind of is every which way. These, the newer ones seem to be much more shrub-like and more uh, where they have more of a compact habit to them, even though they're getting bigger. I just think it, overall it's a better look in the garden. So this is actually one called, the, again, Purple Emperor. It uh, has uh, these wonderful purple flowers, five to six inch long panicles, uh, which is nice. This is actually part of a series, um, of the English Butterfly series. And so this is another one in the English Butterfly series called Adonis Blue. And you see how deep blue these flowers are. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of deep blue flowers. And uh, I've grown Black Knight Butterfly Bush. I think this is a much better one than Black Knight. Uh, it does have these deep blue flowers and 10 to 12 inch long panicles of flowers. So this long, if you can imagine, 10 to 12 inches of flowers. So it seems like those panicles just keep blooming and blooming and blooming. And it, so you get a nice long bloom period out of just one single panicle. So that's pretty exciting in my mind. Always keep in mind these dark blue flowers, of course. You can see how dark it is. So it needs to be one that either you need to have a light background to it or you need to see it up close because this is definitely one of those that you're not going to be able to see it very well from far away. So sort of keep that in mind to have it up close close or, or certainly have maybe even a chartreuse go for it and have a chartreuse plant behind it. So make sure that it shows up well. So Adonis Blue. And another one in that butter, the English Butterfly series is this Peacock. And so we're back to that wonderful 10 to 20, 12 inch long panicles. Uh, and it's, it, this I think is probably one of the largest blooms of this whole series of these English Butterfly series. Uh, it really is a very nice one. It's Even though it is tall, we're back to that kind of five, maybe even six feet tall, um, but it, it tends to be just so much more compact. And I would absolutely use something like this for like even a specimen plant. If you're really trying to have that kind of knockout kind of focal point plant, uh, this one I think would fill the bill because you'd find it would totally bloom all, pretty much all summer long. Once it gets going, it really gets going. And, and it's definitely one of those, uh, what is that kind of plant people will be asking you. So that's kind of a, a lot when it comes to, obviously, butterfly bushes. So we're back to, and I will mention on the plant list, if you have that in front of you, you'll see that I list other plants that I'm not necessarily going to talk about within this program. And you may find that those are other ones that, that you might want to think about. So there's a number of butterfly bushes I mentioned. So now we're on to maybe a plant that you're not all that terribly familiar with, but this is called beautyberry. Sometimes people also call it calicarpa by its, its genera name. And this is one of those people will go, what is that? Because about this time of year, this is the plant that not only does it have this kind of maroony foliage on it, it does have a flower. You can see it's just now starting to flower there on the left. But it, then it has this magnificent uh, f fruit on it and you'd swear you know you look at this kind of pinkish purple fruit and you'd swear that cannot be real that has to be a fake color because nature just doesn't make a fruit that color but believe me this is truly the color of these of these fruits so it is definitely one of those so this is actually one that has lots of fruit on it and you get quite a bang for your buck so we can see really kind of how tall it is here that kind of four to uh, five feet tall and definitely grown for its for its fruit. So it, another great focal point type plant. 
Now, when it comes to other plants, I, I think of, when I think of flowering shrubs, I often think of, obviously, butterfly bush. But this would be the other one that I would think of, blue. Sometimes it's called bluebeard. Sometimes people call it caryopteris, again, by its genera name. And it, with caryopteris, I think one of the great things about this particular plant is that uh, it's overall, all the cultivars are about the same size. They kind of run into that two to four feet tall. Um, there are a number of different species, so you do kind of have to pay attention. Some of them are a little taller than others. Uh, Nice, fine texture. I think the thing that I truly love about this plant is the bees and the butterflies adore this plant. And the nice thing is, is that it flowers and really gets going, you know, late season, about the time the sedums and stuff are blooming, so kind of that August, September, when, when the butterflies and the bees are at their highest population, when they need food. So this is really, it comes at just that perfect time when a lot of um, our great pollinators are looking for something to feed on. So I love it for that. I love, it has very, kind of a fine texture to it, so I think it's an easy one to use within a flower garden situation. It, it is another one of those, kind of like the butterfly bush, sometimes you will get some winter kill on it. And generally what I have found is not so much the winter kill is as it is a wet winters. It just really is not a plant, uh, either either in the winter or in the summer, is not a plant for wet sites. It just it really suffers terribly. So you need really well-drained soils. It is very drought tolerant, so that's the good part. Uh, and it really, I, I think, is another one that if you're just sort of you know, dipping your toe into flowering shrubs, this would definitely be one I would think of because it, it is an easy one to take care of. And generally in well-drained sites, it's going to be just a long-lasting plant for you and not have to worry too much about uh, doing much of anything with it. So, so that's kind of the general idea when it comes to Caryopteris or the bluebeards. Certainly some nice ones that are out there now. This, this is the Little Miss Sunshine, and it has these really bright yellow leaves. You can see there's kind of this trend for these chartreuse leaves, but, but how wonderful it is to add within a flower garden to have these chartreuse leaves, and then to have that contrast with that blue flower is that you can't hardly beat that. This wonderful kind of this deep amethyst blue flowers. Uh, we're talking about usually these are start blooming around July and then into the fall. Uh, they're reportedly deer resistant. I'm always a little hesitant to say that because I don't know that for sure, um, but some folks have said that they've had pretty good luck with this being deer resistant, so that might be another one for you. So three feet tall, three feet wide, easy one to use, and um, you could have a mass of these and just be very, very happy with them because you have the chartreuse leaves in the early in the year, and then uh, as the blue flowers come to fruition, then you'll, you'll find you're really excited about this plant. It says another one called the Sunshine Blue 2. It's a two to three feet tall. Seems to be more cold tolerant, so if you really have had a hard time getting these carry through the winter time, this Sunshine Blue 2 uh, might be an excellent one for you because there seems to be some really good reports about this one being much more cold tolerant, um, in including the Sunshine Blue, more tolerant than it. So that might be another one to think about. But uh, you can see it's not in a flower, and I think it's just really attractive. You could, if you can imagine either uh, um, annuals or perennial flowers around it, it uh, makes a really nice contrast. And then this is it in flower, more of a purplish blue flower. So that, that contrast is really gorgeous in my mind. And then how about petite blue? This is another one of those that's really pretty tiny, two and a half feet to two and a half feet wide. Uh, very kind of a glossy green leaf, which we're not typically thinking of when it comes to Caryopteris, uh, with kind of some deep blue flowers. There's one that's similar to this one called Pink Chablis, if you're not into blue, uh, and rather have the pink flowers, that would be a good one. So Pink Chablis might be another good option for you. And then this is a, another one. This is a Petite Blue again. So this is really kind of a nice one. So you can see it actually in flower and then also used in a container. And it, the smaller flowers, and it, you can see it's a delicate plant. So it's not one, again, for way back in the border. It needs to be one that has, you know, either up close or something where you're going to have some, some contrasting plants around it. It's a sterling silver bluebeard, and this is actually some pictures sent by one of our master gardeners here in Champaign County. And, and I, I love the foliage. It almost looks like artemisia, like some of those like silver artemisias that we have there. But here it is. This is Caryopteris again with the silvery foliage. And so you can see it there on the left, even when it's not in flower, it's really a pretty plant. And then there to the right when it goes ahead and has those late season flowers. So kind of all season interest. And I think that's the other thing that I like about this particular plant. 
Another plant you may not be all that terribly familiar with, but I think it's definitely one we should think about when it comes to actually using it in flower border situations. A little bit taller than maybe some of the other plants that we've talked about. So this one, the straight species kind of runs into that five to 10 feet tall. Maybe some of the cultivars are a little bit smaller. Very dark, kind of dark green, kind of glossy leaves. So those are particularly nice. Um, and, and then sort of overall, I will say about these summer sweets, are they're called clethras. Uh, these are ones that have very fragrant flowers, kind of that July, August, uh, nice yellow fall color typically. But I, I will definitely tell you this is one of those plants that does so much better in moist, acidic soils with lots of organic matter. So if that does not describe your soil, you may find that this plant is not going to be very happy for you. You may find it the leaves tend to turn yellow when they're not supposed to turn yellow, uh, and it just falters. So moist, acidic soil, lots of organic matter, and it certainly can take some shade just fine. So this would be one of those that if you're those high pH soils, you may find that this one is not a good choice for you. It is native to wet areas and does very well in those wet areas and uh, even even extremely wet areas, but doesn't like dry areas. So keep that in mind. It will, if it's particularly happy, it will sucker and send up some shoots. So you might think about that a little bit too. There's some newer ones called Hummingbird. It has some really nice, very long panicles. And then Ruby Spice is another one. It has kind of a rose-colored flower. So I think if you have the soil for it, those moist, acidic areas, I think Summer Sweet's a really, really good one for you. And here you can see it in flower. Uh, to me, it, again, it's almost that fireworks kind of look to it and very, very attractive. And, of course, we always have to think about the winter time, right? We, winter will come. We're pretty sure here in Illinois, winter will come. Uh, and how about a red twig dogwood? And you cannot beat this when it comes to the red stems on this particular plant. But this happens to be one that is a much smaller one than we typically think of with red twig dogwood. So this is Arctic fire. So we're into that kind of three to four foot tall um, and wide. Uh, pretty upright. It does not sucker the way other red twig dogwoods do. So it tends to be much more refined in a the landscape, these intense red stems. And I would definitely tell you that this is one of those plants, like all the red twig dogwoods, I would periodically actually trim it down to the ground and let the new stems come up uh, because it is one of those that the new stems tend to be redder and just nicer looking. So sometimes just a, a quick prune late season um, actually can work out very well. Late season meaning um, late in the winter time, early spring would be a good time to sort of prune those back and get that new foliage. And, you know, we can't get this out of herbaceous perennials, right? So herbaceous perennial flowers, that's for sure. So this would be one to think about. I, Carol Mackey, Daphne, maybe one that you're, I think it's one of those plants that if you've ever discovered it, you've decided it's pretty darn wonderful, I think. Because anybody that I've ever seen that have, has uh, gotten to know this particular plant or gotten to know Carol here uh, is very happy with it. So this is Carol Mackey, Daphne. So you may not be all that terribly familiar with it. Love the foliage with this kind of yellow edge around it. And I just love uh, how compact it is. It does have these wonderful fragrances fragrant flowers, which we don't always get in a lot of plants. It tends to be kind of semi-evergreen, kind of three feet tall, three feet wide. It is one of those that I will tell you it's a little bit, sometimes Carol can be a little bit finicky, as in really not very happy with extremely wet soils, as in poor drainage. Moisture is fine, likes moist soils, but if it's going to sit in water for any period of time, she's not very happy, and you may find that, that over time she kind of dies out. So it's another one of those really think about the siding, maybe even plant it a little bit high, as in on a slight mound, and you'll find that she's going to be much happier to have that good drainage, and then just make sure um, even that maybe a little bit protection from winter winds, because she is a semi-evergreen, to have some protection uh, from winter winds can help. So it is another one of those that I think it's well worth it and having these wonderful fragrant flowers. Put it next to a sidewalk or somewhere where you're going to walk close to it and you'll, you'll be so excited. So well, you know, well sighted. It's an excellent, excellent plant. And you can kind of see here how just how wonderfully mounded it is. And that's not from pruning. That's just the way it is. It has this wonderful mound of, of foliage and then these spring flowers. So very, very nice compound. 
And then Dusia is one of those that maybe I think it again. It, it once people realize what they are or realize that, that Dusias exist, they think they're pretty cool. And this happens to be one called Chardonnay Pearls. Ducey has been around for a long time, and, and I think it's one of those that kind of fell out of favor. Or we didn't hear a whole lot about it, but now we have lots of these newer cultivars. So this is one Chardonnay Pearls is that kind of three uh, tall, three foot wide, three foot tall, and it has kind of a chartreuse leaf to it. And that's really a nice combo. Here you can see it's just getting ready to flower. And as we look at the next slide here, that's really why it's called Chardonnay Pearls, is that you have this kind of yellowish uh, uh, leaf color. And then with the flower buds themselves, they look like little pearls. And then they open up to these star-shaped flowers. And it's just prolific when it comes to these beautiful star-shaped flowers all over the plant. And just really a nice one. I've been very impressed with this plant. As in, even though it says three feet tall, three feet wide, it seems to be pretty slow growing. So uh, I'm totally comfortable with it uh, in, in certain areas and find that it does very, very well. And I don't have to worry too much about it, just overwhelming the other plants. It, it is one of those that... Um, the, the leaves themselves, I think, kind of fade a little bit. Uh, as I said, with some of the chartreuse plants, they kind of fade a little bit over the summertime, but that's okay, and it still is really an excellent one to have. It does bloom on old wood, so this is one of those plants that you can't be prone in it, you know, early spring or really late in the uh, fall or into winter, or you're going to lose your flower buds. So it is one of those we have to make sure that we maintain the plant over the winter, but it's very winter hardy, and, and that doesn't seem to be an issue. And another one that's we're into that pearl thing, although it's a completely different plant, this is one called a pearl bush. Uh, it is not a duty, it's an exocorda, which is a completely different plant. Uh, this is one called the bride. The older versions of, of pearl bush tend to be kind of tall and, you know, they flower and they're like, okay, and we're okay with them. But this one is so much better in that it performs so many more flowers. And I think we all, we all have to realize, of course, that, you know, the, the industry people that are coming up with all these plants, you know, they like the same things we like. We like more flowers. And we like compact plants. We like low maintenance. So when they're out there selecting different ones that they're going to go ahead and introduce, they're looking for those same things that we like. And plus they know that's the kind of thing we like too. So, so this is one called The Bride. Uh, very compact, this kind of uh, pearl-like flower bud, and then opens up to this very wonderful white flower in the springtime. It's usually in April. Uh, it does best in, in, again, sort of full sun, moist soil, kind of that typical thing. And because it does flower so early in April, it is one that blooms on old wood. So it's definitely another one of those you have to pay attention to. If you're going to do any kind of pruning, if you want to, you'd want to make sure that you do it right after it flowers. Now, Forsythia, I guess, is another one of those. I'd kind of put in the same kind of realm as Barberry, as in, you know, we all, you know, all kind of know about Forsythia, and they're out there and all over the place. But there's really been a lot of, um, uh, I guess, not so much when it comes to being too excited about Forsythia these days. Uh, it, you know, because half the time they didn't flower, and they only flowered at the base, and then the rest of the year they were just this brand, big green mass like you see here. And so they weren't all that terribly excited. It was so of like much ado about nothing when it comes to, came to Forsythia. We loved the early flowers when nothing else was blooming. That part was great. Well, the good news is with a lot of the newer ones now, they paid attention to that, that lovely, wonderful yellow early color from the flowers. But now these are so much more cold hardy that we don't have to worry nearly so much about uh, having to worry about uh, whether they're going to make it through the winter. This is a, one called Gold Tide, and one of the reasons why it's called Gold Tide, it's one to two feet tall, but it's three to four feet wide. So this would be a nice kind of ground cover type of plant. Again, sort of blooming kind of that March and April kind of time period. Again, these bloom on old wood, so we have to maintain that old wood. Any pruning should be done after they flower. Sometimes on this one, I will say after my big long speech about these being more winter hardy, sometimes you do get a little winter kill on this particular one. Uh, so you may want to, but it's only one to two feet tall. So, you know, throw a few extra leaves on it or something and you should be just fine with that. So that would be one. But if you're in an especially severe climate, you, you may decide that that's not necessarily going to be a good one for you. Uh, you can, right after they flower, you can certainly cut them to the ground. And if you decide to go that route and really um, really get them going again for the, the next year, these are reported to be deer resistant. Again, you can sort of take that with a grain of salt and kind of think through that. 
the one that I've been particularly excited about, or the, the couple that I've been excited about, is this whole um, sort of show-off series of forsythias. I think they have so much going for them. You can see one of the nice things about them is that not only do they have flowers on them, but the flowers are from tip to tail. I mean, the whole stem has flowers on it. So you get this wonderful, again, so that March and April when we're all dying to see something in flower, oh, what a wonderful sight on this. This particular one, it happens to be that two to three feet tall, uh, three to four feet wide, so a little bit wider than it is tall, but, you know, you can't hardly beat that size when, you, when it comes to sort of fitting it easily into a flower border. So this would be a great one, a flower border. Put it around plants then that are going to go ahead and flower into the summer, and uh, you'll find that this is really just a, maybe just an excellent backdrop for some of your other plants. This show off sugar baby. The first time I saw this one, I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe. What is that? Like, it kind of looks like a forsythia, but it looks like a forsythia on steroids. The flowers are huge, they're uh, all up and down the whole stem. Uh, just a magnificent plant. I was just so impressed with this particular one. So if this one continues to be winter hardy for us, uh, I think this will be a great one that people will really enjoy having. So again, add this one to your flower border and put your other flowers, daylilies, whatever you have around it. But I guarantee you this will be a plant you'll, you'll be so glad come March and April that you added it, added it to your flower border. Not a whole, we don't have a whole lot of cultivars when it comes to Father Gilla, and I know it's kind of a funny name, but I think the one thing that's particularly nice about this plant is just the fact that it is one of those that flowers kind of when other things are not flowering, kind of like with Forsythia. We get that early flowering. So it, it actually flowers before the leaves come out. So it's kind of in that April, kind of early May for us here in East Central Illinois. And it has these kind of bottle brush, really cool looking flowers. Again, maybe through the rest of the year, flowers like this wouldn't be all that exciting. But when nothing else is blooming or you know, little is blooming, these really show off. They're a little bit taller, that four to five foot tall for this particular one. This is a cultivar that's been around for a long time, but I think it's definitely one to think about. I think the other thing that's particularly nice about this plant is just the fact that it has this fabulous fall color. So it's really doing things kind of on the ends of the spectrum when it comes to the season. It has wonderful early, early flowers and then great fall color. So a nice one to add. This is a, definitely another one of those I'd put into that category where it likes moist, acidic soil. It does fine, actually, in partial shade. So this is actually a very nice, Father Gillas are very nice companions when it comes to rhododendrons and azaleas and even that summer sweet that we talked about earlier. So kind of keep that in mind. So high pH soils it's not necessarily going to be a very happy plant or really, really dry soil, so it won't be a happy plant. But uh, think about some of the companions maybe to your uh, rhododendrons and azaleas. Now, of course, we have to talk about hydrangeas when it comes to flowering shrubs. Uh, and it's almost too, in some respects, I think it's almost too bad that when we first started getting in over the last few years here, we first started talking more and more about flowering shrubs. It seemed like hydrangeas were sort of like the poster child of flowering shrubs. So everybody was excited about hydrangeas. But I will tell you, they're not the easiest plants in the world to grow. And I think for a couple of reasons, and I guess not all of them are easy to grow, for a couple of reasons, hydrangeas... There are actually a number of different species of hydrangeas, so sometimes it makes it very confusing because you don't know which species you have, and some of them are more winter hardy than others, the flowers are different, so sometimes it's very confusing. So hydrangeas have always been the ones I'd say, if you're, if you're going to save any plant labels, always save the plant labels from your hydrangeas because you really need to know if you're having problems with it or whatever, what's its parentage, you know, which, which uh, species is it, and then it helps folks like me, extension educators, to help you figure out maybe why it's not flowering or why it's not turning blue or why it's not doing whatever it's doing. So I think that's one of the big things. So save the tag, save the tag. One of the things that's particularly confusing, I think, about hydrangeas is just the fact that some of them actually bloom on new wood. In other words, the stems that are produced this year, this growing season, and some of them bloom on old wood. In other words, the stems that were produced last year. And so it makes it very confusing to know when do I prune it? Um, should I prune it in the spring? Should I prune it in the fall? 
And sometimes if we prune it at the wrong time or if we get winter killed, then we don't get any flowers. And so that's not fun because this is truly a plant that we're growing it for the flowers. The foliage is like okay. I'd say an oak leaf hydrangeas is very pretty, but for most of the hydrangeas, I'm not all that terribly excited about the foliage so much. It's, it's sort of nice and green, but, you know, not all that exciting. We're really growing these guys for the flowers. So bottom line is save the label, save the label, save the label, and that will help all of us. So one of the reasons I put these two particular ones up, so this is hydrangeas, this is panicle hydrangeas and smooth hydrangeas, and the reason I put these up, these are by far the two that are the easiest to grow. These will bloom on pretty much no matter what because they bloom on new wood. They're very cold hardy. So if you look at the parentage of whatever hydrangeas you're deciding to grow and you really have not been happy with some of the other ones or have had trouble getting some, through some of the other ones through the wintertime, look for panicle hydrangeas and the smooth hydrangeas. These are really the ones you want to think about. So these are by far the easiest ones to grow. And so this is hydrangea paniculata, and this is hydrangea arborescence. And so that's, those are the fancy names for those, but kind of look for that parentage uh, to make sure that you have ones that are going to do well for you because you just maybe are having issues with the other ones. The other ones that we will see are the big leaf hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla, which is there on the left. This one really got to be so, you know, this was like the first one everybody sort of got into because everybody wanted those bright blue flowers that seemed to be the big thing. So big leaf hydrangea. The problem with big leaf hydrangea is that often it is not cold hardy for us, and it is one of those that blooms on old wood, or most of them bloom on old wood. We have some newer cultivars now that bloom on old and new wood, but in the past it was always just the old wood. So that's one of the issues with this one is that if you dipped your toes into hydrangeas, you ended up with one of these blue ones and then it's never been blue again or it never flowers, you may find you really need to think about some of the other uh, species of hydrangeas and have a little bit better luck with it. Um, the other ones that we will have, we'll see are oak leaf hydrangeas as well as mountain hydrangeas. And so those are, might be some other options for you, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail. So we do have some of those that, that might be some real options for you. So big leaf hydrangea, the other thing I will tell you is that big leaf hydrangea is the one that you really, it, it really makes a big difference on the soil pH on whether it's going to be pink or blue. You can't take those panicled hydrangeas, the ones I showed earlier, the panicled hydrangea and the smooth hydrangea, and expect those to turn pink or blue unless that's actually part of the cultivar. Does that make sense? So hopefully if, as you think through that, because so, I've had people have the white smooth hydrangea and trying to turn it blue. Well, it's never going to turn blue because that's not its, its genetic makeup. So if you really want those pink and blue ones, typically we're looking at, looking at the big leaf hydrangea or the mountain hydrangeas when it comes to pink or blue because those are the two that are affected by the soil pH. And actually, it's, it's the amount of aluminum that's actually in the soil. But the soil pH um, makes a big difference on how much aluminum is available to it. So that makes a big difference. So those would be the things to think about. Okay, so what are some of the hydrangeas we can think about? So this is big leaf hydrangea. This, these are a couple of the ones that do bloom on uh, old as well as new wood. So the nice thing about these, this is kind of in that same line as what we saw earlier in, you know, years ago, this Endless Summer was one of the first ones that came out. Um, now these new series of Let's, Let's Dance or another ones that, that, that bloom on old as well as new wood. Um, I, I haven't always had the best of luck with Endless Summer, even though it's supposed to bloom on old and new wood. It's, it, for me, at least, it's always been Endless Disappointment with Endless Summer. Uh, but you may find I, I've seen pretty good reports about this less dance series that it seems like it does a much better job of actually blooming on old wood and new wood. Um, but for most of the time when I see these big leaf hydrangeas, most of the time they never bloom on the old wood because it tends to get killed, but it will eventually bloom on the new wood. So kind of keep that in mind, or maybe if you're in a more southern part of Illinois, or uh, you may find that these actually do a little bit better for you than maybe some of the other ones from the past. So you might try the Let's Dance series. So when we get into the smooth hydrangeas, so this is uh, actually slide number 49 there on your plant list. And so this is Invincible, In Invincible Spirit. So this is one of the smooth hydrangeas. It really is one of those is uh, really kind of a pink flowering version of Annabelle. Annabelle has been around forever. And if you're not familiar, actually, Annabelle hydrangea actually came from Anna, Illinois. 
so we have some Illinois heritage there when it comes to Annabelle hydrangeas. But this is a pink version of that one. And it, and it is a very nice one, kind of four feet tall, four feet wide. Uh, this is one of those that, keep in mind, it's, it's not affected by soil pH. So this is truly the cultivar itself. Um, turning actually these pink colors. So this is just part of it. So you're not going to be able to turn this one blue, in other words. So this is truly a pink version of Annabelle hydrangea. And then Incredible is, again, another one of those at Arborescence. Um, it, these huge flowers. I mean, to me, it's almost like I just can't hardly believe how big the flowers are. You can see the hand there are these 12-inch wide flowers. Uh, I guess if you really, really want like a super focal point, this is the plant for you because, wow, look at those. Those are huge. Uh, sometimes I have found these to be a little floppy. Um, this one uh, is reported to be less floppy than like Annabelle and some of the other um, of these that have these big uh, ball-shaped flowers. So Incredible is supposed to be much more upright and not flop over like the other ones because there's so much uh, so much flower there. So you you might it might be one you decide you want to go with. So uh, these would definitely be ones that I would. Uh, pruned back in late winter just to really encourage some new strong stems and some good flowering and all that kind of good stuff. So it is one of those that I think is really nice and pretty adaptable plants if you, if you think about it. These smooth hydrangeas, are, they t certainly take shade. Um, I wouldn't put them in full shade, but certainly will take some shade. And bobo hydrangea is in that panicled hydrangea. And you can see how the flower shape's a little different. It's almost uh, almost has a point on it. So you can kind of tell just by looking at the flowers that it, these are in that parentage of the panicled hydrangeas. So this is bobo, three feet tall, four feet wide. Uh, nice strong stems tend to tend to stay upright nicely. Um, the other thing that is that is really kind of nice about this bobo is the fact that as the flowers age, they get this pink tone to them. And we've seen this a lot in a lot of the newer cultivars of hydrangeas, the panicle hydrangeas, where they start out kind of white and then age to pink, which is really pretty in my mind. You kind of get this uh, multi-season kind of look to it, where the plant actually changes over time. I guess if you don't like pink, then you're kind of out of luck. But for some of these, because that seems to be the, the common color for most of these others besides the big leaf hydrangea. And at Little Lime, you can see it has is another one of those three feet tall uh, and wide. This is uh, the new dwarf form of limelight. And limelight hydrangea has been out for a number of years. The flowers, as they age, go from this kind of greenish color to burgundy. So just like this picture shows that you'll often see sort of multicolor to it. So as you look at this, like why do you need other flowers in some respects? Because you've actually got almost multi flowers on here because you have the newer flowers that are green and then they're aging to this kind of pinky color. So I think that's nice. And I think overall hydrangeas are nice in that the flowers, even as they age, look great. So it might be ones that really, really think through on, on if these would be a good ones to sort of add to your landscape. And then again, sort of little little lime here. It, it tends to be the nice thing about this one is just the fact that it 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 doesn't seem to flop as much. Little lamb was another one of those, and I think this is really confusing sometimes. But little lamb was one of the newer ones too, and it tended to kind of flop over. And this little lime series doesn't seem to be nearly as bad, or this little lime um, particular one doesn't seem to be nearly as bad. So that's kind of nice. And with a name like Pinky Winky, how can you go wrong? Uh, Pinky Winky always makes me think that it must be this tiny little plant, but they're really not. They can easily be six feet tall. Uh, the nice thing about these is, again, we're in those panicles, and you can see just by looking at the flower how it is this panicle heritage to this one. Uh, these The panicles themselves can get 16 inches long, which is just quite a bang for your buck when it comes to flowers. Uh, I think the other thing that's particularly nice about Pinky Winky is just you can kind of see it in this picture is that as the flowers age, they actually will change to pink. So the the panicle itself is this wonderful 16 inches long, whereas you find on the very tip of it, maybe the first you know four or five inches have white flowers, and then the rest of it, maybe in the next eight or nine inches or whatever, has a kind of pinky flowers. So you get kind of a two-tone flower look to it, which I think is really attractive in the landscape as well. So you get a, these are really showstopper kinds of plants. And a little quick fire. That quick fire was a number one that came out a number of years ago. Again, where this is the smaller version of it because quick fire was more than that six feet tall, so you have space. It's a nice one. Little quick fire we're in is more into that three to four foot. 
and it's certainly a smaller version. I think the good thing about Little Quick Fire, what it has to offer, is the fact that it will bloom about a month before other hydrangeas. So if you're one of those that's just really like, why aren't these things flowering? I can't wait till the hydrangeas flower. Maybe Little Quick Fire is a really good one for you because it does have that uh, easily a month early flowering. And oak leaf hydrangea, I, I think, is definitely one of those that you need some. It is, it is quite the focal point plant, and I, I would say you really need some space. Even though we have some smaller versions of it, it still needs some space. And I would also say that simply because even the dwarf form peewee is, is still three feet tall. But the other reason I would say that is just the fact that oak leaf hydrangeas have a lot of mass to them. They have these huge flowers, huge leaves. Um, they have actually a great exfoliating stems, as you can see here. This is actually out at the Idea Garden again, and you can see this beautiful. So that's really very pretty uh, look to it in the winter time. You can see those nice exfoliating stems, fall color. Look at that, and you can see why it's called oak leaf hydrangea. Obviously, it looks like an oak leaf, but these are fabulous fall color. But these are very large leaves. Has a lot. It's a very coarse texture to it. Has a lot of mass to it. So it's not one that I would, you know, I wouldn't put any wimpy flowers next to it because it will just totally overwhelm them in um, just f as a focal point. So it's a really good one for that. This is a great one, a back of the border kind of thing where you really want something even back of your property. Uh, and it really makes a nice show off plant because it is so big and shows off very, very well. And mountain hydrangeas, you not be, may not be as familiar with these, but this is hydrangea serrata. And this is tiny, tough stuff. We're getting some really good reports about this one. It does bloom on old as well as new wood, 18 to 24 inches tall. It is one of those that it has blue flowers and acidic soil and then pink flowers and alkaline soil. You can see how the flower itself is much different, or the flower, the inflorescence is much different, and it has these um, sterile flowers and as well as um, fertile flowers there in the center. So very, very pretty. And getting some pretty good reports about it, this one, it definitely seems to be pretty hardy for us. So the hydrangea serrata, this tiny tough stuff. And in the realm of maybe you haven't heard of it, but maybe you should hear of it, this happens to be another one of those uh, native plants. So this is actually Little Henry Sweet Spire. And it is native to wet areas. Uh, you can see I, I love the, this in flower. It almost looks like, again, sort of fireworks kind of look to it. it. It certainly will take some shade. It's actually very tolerant of wet sites, and it actually is native to wet air, very wet areas. So nice native plant, uh, full sun to full shade. So it's very adaptable as long as it has some moisture. It's very adaptable. And you can see this is it in, fla in uh, fall color, just intense, intense red fall color, so really a nice one. And if you're looking for something a little bit different in the wintertime, how about some green stems instead of red stems? This Japanese caria, this happens to be one of the uh, cultivars is Planiflora, which is a double-flowered uh, Japanese caria. So you may not be all that terribly familiar with this plant. It does take shade pretty well, but those kind of intense green uh, stems that you would see over the wintertime is just really something different. And I do like the, the flowers on it as well, so Japanese caria. Nine barks have certainly been around for a number of years. I will say just a couple of things about nine barks. Is one that the kind of the first one that kind of came out was called uh, Diablo or Diablola, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, and it, what what we have found here, at least in East Central Illinois, is that we have a terrible problem with powdery mildew on it. So it's a great plant. I love having nine barks, but really watch the powdery mildew. So um, Diablo was really a tough one for us to try to grow. Now here's this one, Coppertina. You can see it has this wonderful kind of coppery foliage to it. It, it doesn't seem to be quite as bad as powder, powder with powdery mildew, but it still gets some powdery mildew on it. So uh, that Coppertina, I've been a little bit concerned about that, but I do love the foliage on it. And this is, again, at the Idea Garden, and it's there with one of those chartreuse barberries. So it's really a nice combo there. I think one of them that maybe is a little bit better and doesn't seem to have nearly powdery mildew issues the summer wine nine bark so that deep kind of and this diablo was the same way it had this kind of maroony foliage with a pink flower but this one is by far a better selection so this is summer wine kind of that five to six feet there's some really smaller ones or like tiny wine and um, that's also and tiny wine gold or some smaller selections if you're looking for some other kind of leaf colors 
and this is summer wine. You can see it's, it's through the rest of the season. So nice in containers, and it just makes a nice backdrop for a lot of other plants. When I was first uh, designing, Potentilla was everywhere. Everybody had Potentilla, and maybe that's why we don't see it nearly as much as we used to. But I think that the sad part is I think it deserves to be used more often. So here it is, uh, Happy Face, White Potentilla, and what a great name, right? So Happy Face, Potentilla. This is one of those three feet tall, three feet wide. I think it's particularly nice for that. Dark green foliage, really nice flowers um, from kind of spring even into, into summer. So you get this kind of, and you can see it's not covered in flowers, but I still think it's a very nice, interesting plant with a nice kind of uh, medium texture to it. So potentil is kind of, again, they're another one of those that are around for a long time, but look at some of the newer cultivars. You may find you actually like it in your designs. I threw a few elderberries in here, although they can get quite large. I think it's nice to have some of these kind of almost, even though they're shrubs, they're really almost like small trees. So we've seen a number of these as a black beauty elderberry. Uh, this is in that 8 to 12 feet tall. So it's big, but it could easily be limbed up to just have it as a tree. And it, they're very, very pretty darn adaptable plants. Uh, you get the season of color just from the foliage itself, and then, of course, pink flowers. And these are, elderberries are really good in wet sites. Um, again, very adaptable, we'll, but would we'll certainly take those wet areas. So this Black Beauty is another one called Black Lace. You can see the foliage is a little, little bit, has a little bit more um, dissections to it. And very pretty. I, these always tend to be a little bit more free form. Uh, they kind of just gangle out a little bit, but I think they're very pretty. Uh, sometimes when people have trouble growing Japanese maples, I think this is a particularly nice um, plant to go with. So if it's just like too wet for Japanese maples, you, find that, you may find that some of these elderberries actually are a nice complement and, instead of killing off one more Japanese maple. You may find you like those. And there's certainly some ones that have chartreuse foliage. This is lemony lace, um, elderberry. And you can see it here uh, just in foliage like this. It's really very attractive. And, of course, there's always spireas. So I kind of put spireas in there with kind of potentillas. Everybody used to have pink spireas, or every farm set had a bridal wreath spirea, like a kazillion of them. Everybody had them. The problem was often with like the bridal wreath spireas, they were just too darn big, just too darn big. So what we've, what we've seen is um, sometimes people kind of shy away from spireas because of that. But I will tell you there's a lots of new ones now and even some newer species that we hadn't seen before. This is like typical sort of pink spirea. Here it's in a very, very difficult spot kind of in between the, the building and the side walk but it continues to flower so the nice thing is they're pretty darn adaptable plants and a lot of them actually are pretty good sizes when it comes to kind of that three to four foot site size it's a little bit different species this is actually the birch leaf spirea glow girl uh, three to four feet tall uh, kind of the pink buds kind of open to these kind of whitish flowers so you get kind of that two-toned look and then kind of yellowish leaves but very compact and very tiny leaves so it has a nice fine texture to it and I've been very impressed with the whole series called double play uh, there's several, there's quite a few different ones out there depending on kind of the different flower colors. So this is Devil Play Artist Spirea. And it, as I mentioned, it, actually on the sheet here, there's a couple of different ones. But the nice thing is I've been so impressed with these, about two feet tall. Uh, I actually have some of these in my yard, and uh, I, I had some uh, fountain grass that kind of overwhelmed them because they were just so, you know, not necessarily like super slow growing, but they weren't like this crazy plant that went out of control. So I actually had to move them simply because they were just being overwhelmed by some of the other perennials. So to me, that's actually a good thing. We don't have to worry about some of these uh, shrubs that sort of eat, eat our homes or eat the other plants. So you might think about these. Nice thing is the foliage comes out kind of this pinkish, kind of reddish look, and then uh, they go ahead and flower pretty much all summer long. I do a little quick deadheading with just um, some just quick shears and kind of deadhead them a little bit, and then they do continue to flower pretty nicely. But say a nice compact size, you don't necessarily have to do this. This is one called the, the Double Play Gold, and you can see it has this wonderful kind of foliage to it, that kind of chartreuse look to the foliage. So spireas are definitely one of those, I'd say. So look at those again. So if you're kind of giving up on spireas, look at some of the new ones. I think you'll be really impressed on what they give to a garden. 
course, we like to have uh, lilacs just for the fragrance, but sometimes an old-fashioned lilac, I think there's certainly a place for that, but sometimes it's a little bit too big, a little bit too overwhelming sometimes in our flower borders, but there are some newer ones now. This is that blue, the bloomerang, and it is one that it will, it does flower in the springtime and then kind of goes through a little rest period, and then it will flower again, so it does kind of come back and give you a few flowers later on as well, so a little bit smaller, and I think it's just more compact and maybe a little bit easier to use in, in, a, in a more uh, flower border kind of design. And then another one called Scent and Sensibility, this pink lilac. And you can see it's truly kind of that kind of mounded shape. We're almost into that shape like a spirea or something, but it is a lilac. And But just realize that these are smaller. You're not going to have that huge flower head like we typically think of with lilac, but it does give us something that's a little bit more refined in a flower border area and certainly some fragrance as well as reblooming. I don't think I've ever met a viburnum I didn't like. I like them all. There's just they're fabulous, fabulous shrubs. They generally are all full season. They look great in the wintertime, look great in, in flower. Often they have fruit on them. I love them. The big drawback, of course, with viburnums is that most of them by far are big plants. So they're not ones, you can see this is like hitting almost the, the eve of the barn. Uh, but most, So most of them are, you really have to have the space for them and almost treat them like a small tree. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. And I think over time we're going to see more and more smaller cultivars of viburnum. But I will tell you right now a lot of them are big. So if you have space for them, I definitely would add, add viburnums to your to your list of plants to put in your garden but just to realize they are they can be quite large um, these are actually some that I, I listed a couple of the smaller ones that are here certainly not necessarily some of the best ones but certainly some of the smaller ones realize there's lots and lots of cultivars of lots and lots of different species so just kind of check those out um, this happens to be one of those is a Korean spice and I think it has a nice uh, complement in the fact that it is very fragrant uh, kind of a pinkish flower to it. And so I think Spice Baby, even though it's still at that kind of five-foot realm, might be a nice one to add. Again, sort of the back of the border kind of thing. It might be a really nice plant to sort of do that. And I and really is a, is a nice selection of the Korean Spice Viburnum. So a little bit smaller and a little nicer flower. There's a gazillion million plants when it comes to wigellas, and there's a, it's another whole grouping of plants. And here we see it with hydrangeas, as well as some of the wigellas, as well as the elderberry, and then one of the herbaceous perennials, um, Veronica. So this is just a, kind of a complement of plants that you might think about adding. Um, but just to realize that wigella, the, wigella is actually the plant that's in between kind of the hydrangea and that veronica so is kind of that middle plant. And we'll look a little bit more at wigella. So my, my Monet is one that I think is particularly nice at 12 to 18 inches tall. Uh, so it's a small shrub. And it really is the first sort of dwarf variegated wigella that was ever introduced. And I think, think it still is a very nice one, nice tight habit to it. Uh, the variegation depends immensely on how much sun or shade it's getting. So I will tell you that uh, it tends to have uh, just to be white and green in more shadier situations. And then the pink, the white, green, and pink comes out really in sunny situations. So if you're really into that pink part, and I found that out, uh, you really need to have it in, in pretty much full sun. Uh, and so you might want to keep that in mind. But it still does nicely in the shade. Uh, another Wigella, again, there's a gazillion million ones of these now. So this is one called uh, Spilled Wine. I don't know who comes up with these names, but what a great name, right? So two, to, two feet tall, three feet wide, kind of a nice spreading habit to it. Uh, this dark red leaves, kind of almost a little wavy leaf to it, and then those hot magenta flowers. So what a great contrast, huh? So here you can see this would be one they could easily add into a mass planting or even tuck into just an existing flower border makes it a particularly nice plant. So there's, a, again, a bunch of wigellas out there, but you really have to do your homework to see which, how tall they are. Not all of them are going to be as small as this particular one. Then there's uh, the whole dance. There's actually a whole series called The Dance. And so, of course, they all have names like samba, rumba, and waltz, and minuet. Those all tend to be some nice small ones, so we might think about those. Um, here we have Sonic Bloom, which is a, one of the pink wigellas, and it does tend to be a nice uh, rebloomer for us. 
So it will bloom in May, and then also, again, even up until frost, you'll get a few flowers if you go ahead and deadhead them. So uh, I think white jellies are really another nice one to add for lots of flowers without a whole lot of work. And this is at actually it in flower, so really has a lot of bang to your buck. Now, conifers, I think, are another one of those. I think even we may be afraid of uh, uh, house-eating shrubs, but I, I think we're also afraid of house-eating conifers because everybody's been around junipers and stuff that have gotten way, 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 way too big. Um, but garden, some of the garden conifers, I will say, are true dwarfs. So keep that in mind. And really, again, sort of check out your garden centers. You may find you're just absolutely excited about some of the garden conifers because they add so much in the wintertime. This is out at the Idea Garden again. Um, so you may find that, that actually these work out very nicely. I think boxwoods are particularly nice and that we do have some that, you know, that dark green color you can't hardly beat in the wintertime. And they do take uh, shearing very well if you're wanting to have something a little bit smaller. And here this is actually with that uh, My Monet Wajala that's there in the front. So it makes a nice backdrop for a lot of plants, and you can't hardly beat it in the wintertime. So this is the one called North Star. It maintains a really good uh, globe shape as well as good green co color in the wintertime. Uh, golden Mop or Mops, False Cypress, sometimes it's called here. It's there to the left. Uh, it, it is one of those you see in just about every box store known to mankind is the Golden Mop. But I will tell you, this is a big plant. You see them when you buy them. They're these tiny little mounds. But they get big. So just really keep that in mind that you may find this is going to be way too big for you unless you're willing to prune it every single year to keep it small. But it is a wonderful plant in the wintertime to have that kind of chartreuse look to it. And here you can see it actually with some um, dark dahlias. So great backdrop for other plants. And Siberian cypress, you may not all be be that terribly familiar with it, but it is. this is one called Celtic Pride, three feet tall, five feet wide. And I think the big thing is, I just thought I'd mention a few of these, just to sort of get you thinking about some of these conifers that are out there, because they're true dwarfs. They're going to stay small, give you something in the wintertime, and it makes such great backdrops for all your other plants. Realize a lot of these do not like to be crowded. Um, this happens to be one that will take, uh, there's much more shade tolerant, this particular Siberian cypress, it's much more shade tolerant than other evergreens as well as other junipers. So if you have lots of shade, it's still not one that's going to be too, super happy in like full deep shade, but it will take a lot more shade. So if you're looking for one, this may be one that you want to try in those shadier sites. Uh, and just realize they don't like to be overwhelmed with a bunch of other plants. So if you're in that English cottage garden, a lot of the conifers are just not going to like that to have other plants kind of flopped over them. So give them some space. This is one of the smaller globe uh, blue spruces. This is Glauca globosa. And, and just another one, there's a bunch of blue spruce uh, conifers out there now and true dwarfs, very slow-growing, compact, and that you can't beat that bluish foliage. And how about an arborvitae? This is one called Anna, Anna's Magic Ball. What a great name, huh? And if you have a name called Anna, you have to have this one, right? So one to two feet tall, very, very compact. And the nice thing about this one, it does seem to have some really good resistance to leaf browning compared to a lot of other of the chartreuse kind of um, arborvitaes as well as some of the other chartreuse evergreens. So it, sometimes leaf browning can be an issue for us, especially in really windy sites. So you may want to think about something like this. So what fun, huh? So there's, I think that's one of the great things about gardening is just having some fun with this, right? But I'm hoping today that you had, you kind of look through maybe your own ideas of what it takes to be a perennial, what it takes to be a flower in your flower border, and maybe you want to decide you want to use some shrubs in there and realize that in the long run, they're a lot less maintenance than what we might actually see you know, with our herbaceous plants. And so we have lots and lots of color when it comes to our shrubs. This is again out at the Idea Garden. You can see how much fun they have out there when it comes to color. And then even just the diversity of plants that are out there. So I, I think that's one of the great things. Go to your local go to your local garden center and actually go to some of your local gardens and see what plants are doing well and hopefully people will add more of these smaller shrubs and find that they're very excited about them. And then when it comes to lower maintenance, here we have a number of those from the, uh, this is actually a variegated dogwood as well as a hydrangea that's in there. You may find you're giving, getting a lot more um, when it comes to some of these flowering shoves, when it comes to beauty year around. And so we still have some time here uh, for some, if people have questions, 
they can con or if they want to ask questions now or if they want to contact me, I'd be glad to help them think through maybe using some other plants that they have, but here's my contact information and you're more than welcome to to contact me. So, does anybody have any questions or comments or things they've found have worked well? Any more show tunes? <laughs> Well, Sandy, okay. we have a yeah. question in Vermilion County from um, sure. Jim Wright, Master Gardener. <laughs> Plucky Master Gardener. But my question is, uh, like some things like scoria, I can kind of really cut back in the fall. Is there a general rule about what kind of woody shrubs you can really cut back and which ones you can't? So which ones you can cut back and which ones you can't? Yeah, yeah. like which ones can you really, uh, I mean, like that blue spruce, obviously, I can't cut that to the ground. And have to right. Up. Like, yeah. is there a general, is it like, uh, just don't cut conifers back and you can cut most other things back? You know, I, you know, it really is one of those things, and that's an excellent question because sometimes that's so confusing. So I think probably the, the biggest thing is when it, when it comes to cutting things back, I would, I've, I've actually been very surprised um, with some plants that I wasn't sure if you could cut them back or not. I, some plants, you could actually take them clear to the ground. Um, I would say things like privets and spireas and so, some of those you can take clear to the ground. You can't do that with all of them. Not all of them are happy with that. But I will say most of them, and I'm going to make a general term here, but most of them, if you cut them back, Again, we're talking about uh, uh, herbaceous, you know, not herbaceous stuff, but stuff that's deciduous, um, stuff that's not evergreen. Uh, generally, if you cut them back to, I would say, a foot, I, and I know that sounds really severe, most of the time, again, you let me know, <laughs> but most of the time, you're probably going to be just fine. You're probably going to be just fine. But I, it's another one of those, if you're really doing drastic pruning, I would really pay attention to when you do it. Um, and I would say most of the time you'd be better off if you can just prune them regularly. Number one, pick a plant that isn't going to get too big. But number two is, is that do it, you know, maybe do it gradually with hand pruners. Don't use shears. Kind of do some hand pruning periodically. And just over time sort of keep them smaller. It's so much easier uh, than, than trying to, like, bring them, you know, from six feet tall now to two feet tall. And they'll just look better and be better. So I know that's really a very general comment, but, but I would say most of the time we can get away with actually pruning them back pretty hard. Uh, I've been surprised with things like viburnums. I had a rabbit that kind of took down one of my viburnums to, like, with 10 inches. You know, it, had a, it went from literally from six feet and then, and then pruned, you know, basically chewed off the bark about uh, 10 inches above the base. And I was amazed. And so I pruned up all the dead stuff, and I was amazed at how well that viburnum t came back. So it certainly happens. I just would not always take all of them down to the ground. And I would always think about when are they flowering. Are they flowering on old wood or new wood? And just realize ones that bloom on old wood, you actually want to prune them after they flower, right after they flower. Otherwise, you'll lose the flowers for that year. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank we, you. I think we had some questions about, I don't know about the association between uh, black-legged tick and barberry. I don't know that one. Someone is asking about, do you know the association? So, so the answer is no. I do not know the association between black-legged tick and barberry. Maybe some of the other educators might be familiar with that. Um, but that would be definitely be something we'd want to look into. Um, are elderberries edible? Absolutely. El el elderberries are edible. Um, generally, you want the, the Canadian one, the native one, um, because there is some concerns with some of the European one from what I understand on how it's prepared, and you generally are always going to prepare them. You're not going to eat them fresh. Um, and actually, I would recommend that you don't eat them fresh. You're not going to eat them raw. They're going to be prepared. So that would be the big thing. So they are ed edible, but you just want to watch how you prepare them. New Jersey tea, 
Um, actually, New Jersey tree is a great plant. I, it's one of those I really thought hard, long and hard about including. It is a native. It does. It's a great plant for butterflies and bees and stuff. It's a great plant. It's kind of what we would consider a sub shrub. And so I would put New Jersey tea into the category of like Caryopteris and butterfly bush. Uh, it's kind of a. It's almost like a. You know, it doesn't have like big woody stems and anything like that. It tends to like a little bit drier sites, so you want to make sure that you um, situate it properly and where it's not super wet. Um, but it's certainly a great native plant, so I would absolutely add that one, and I would have if I had a little more time. So how late in fall can shrubs be trimmed in northern Illinois? So how late can they be trimmed? Well, I guess it depends on what you're trimming. So again, I assume it's one of those things where um, you're, uh, personally, if I was going to do some major pruning and it was on a shrub that did not bloom early, so I wasn't going to have to worry about losing the flowers itself. Generally, I always wait until uh, March, like February and March. So let them, rather than pruning them now. I, I let them go through the winter time, and then, because then, I guess my feeling has always been, and other people may disagree, but my feeling has always been, if you're really going to prune something hard and do some major pruning on it, you really want it to be in a time when it can recover quickly. And if you, if we do a lot of major pruning right now, it, you know, they've got all winter to sort of hang out and make it through the winter and all that kind of stuff before they actually can, can leaf out again. So I, I always wait. I always wait until right before they leaf out. Again, if it's a one that blooms early you probably want to wait till after it flowers so hopefully that answers that question hey sandy we've got a question from patty stoffel in champaign uh-huh so just go go for it patty okay um i have black lace elderberry at home and they did very poorly this year i'm wondering if that is common in this area right now if it could have been due to the high heat level mm. or if you know, if there's something going on with those this year. I, and they're not together. They're on opposite sides of my home. And uh, I think one of them is gone. So they both look bad? They both look bad, but one of them has survived. At least half of it is still alive. Okay, so so, so the stems are actually dead, or is it the foliage? Um, the foliage has, the, the one that is, is the most severely affected, the foliage is gone now, and all I've got is a bunch of twigs sticking up. Right. Yeah, I would check, because normally, you know, they had plenty of moisture. They should have loved the rain this year. You know, in most of our areas, we had plenty of rain, and they should have been very happy with that. So the rain shouldn't have been an issue. The heat, I think what I've, what I'd be a little bit concerned about and what I've noticed even on some of my sumacs and some of those is that, uh, especially, so did this just happen? It seemed like they were just kind of losing their leaves recently um, or not? No, it, it no. started probably yeah. a couple months back. Okay. So I, I would, so two things, I would check and see uh, if, um, so are these new plants or not? Um, one of them is two years old. The other one is probably about eight years old and they've been fine until now. Yeah. There's a, there's a couple of things with elderberries. They certainly, they certainly can get some, um, they actually can get some twig blights, some fungal blights that actually on, on the twigs themselves. And so the twigs die back because of, they get this fungal blight. Um, they certainly can get borers. Uh, we, we've certainly, we've even seen that out at the idea garden there in Urbana. We've had some borer issues as well as some twig blight. So once in a while we'll have those kind of things. So I do a little bit of investigation. So number one, I'd make it sure that the twigs are actually dead because what you may have found is they, they just drop their leaves, but the twigs are still alive. So I would do a little investigation and just kind of, you know, scratch the stem with your thumbnail and see if it's still alive. And in, in which case I would just wait and see what happens next year. Um, if, and Beyond that, I would sort of look and see if you see any sort of sunken in areas that might indicate like a canker, because that's kind of what we saw in the elderberries in the past, um, as well as maybe even holes from like borers. So you may have had a few issues with that. The good news is, is that they often will, will sucker up from the base. So sometimes, so. yeah, so sometimes they will absolutely do that. But yeah, they have, they're probably in that realm of ones that have maybe a little bit of insect and disease issue, but usually not bad. This should have been a good year for them. But. Thank you. Uh -huh. So any other questions? Hey, Sandy, Bill Ford in Champaign has a question. 
Okay. Uh, Sandy, I've got a blue meringue uh, lilac and really uh, <clears throat> five feet tall, very healthy. And then I noticed one of the branches that came up from the base, all the leaves died and I could just lift it right off the base. Oh. And I noticed there was a very, very tiny little worm in the inside the uh, bark. And I'm wondering uh, if that's normal. Well, no, I mean, lilacs can get borers as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be another one of those that we'd really have to check and see. They, so they do get borers. Um, and I'd have to check. I, don't, I haven't had to worry about that too terribly much, but we'd have to check and see what the, uh, what the treatment might be for those. Right offhand, I don't remember exactly what it is, so we'd have to kind of look that up. Um, but they do get borer. They get it, they, I mean, it's, they get it so commonly it's called lilac borer, so... Okay. You know, unfortunately, Thanks. they do get a bore. So we'd really have to look that up. I don't know. Here I've got um, – you can prune – certainly pruning them out. It would be a matter of actually if you wanted to treat them, it actually would be spraying them in mid-June um, with one of the one of the products called per, um, permethrin would be – and then you spray it again two weeks later. So it would take a chemical treatment if you want to go that route, mm -hmm. um, if you decide you want to take care of the bore issue. But that sure is what it sounds like. Okay. So. Yeah. So any other? So are the zones listed for these shrubs somewhere? All of the shrubs that I included are uh, at least uh, zone five, I will say. So they're all hardy for, at least, certainly for Illinois. If you wanted to do a little bit more investigation, certainly all of these are ones that you could check online if you want to have want to know more about where they are. But there's certainly a hardy here through through Illinois. So any other questions or hopefully this is giving you a chance to sort of look at plants anew when it comes to figuring out now you have all winter long to decide what plants you want to add to your flower garden. So thank you all very much for uh, joining us. And of course, uh, keep in mind that the past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening Series is on YouTube. This particular one will be up uh, a few days after we'll, we'll actually do this one again and on Thursday, and then it'll be up a, a few days after that. So just realize that um, Four Seasons Gardening Series, you can check it out on YouTube. So thank you all.